All right, we're back here on Tennis Channel Inside In into the week of February. Mitch Michaels from the Santa Monica Studios. Mark Petchy back on the show in person. Got the camera set up. It's Valentine's Day. We're feeling the love. Thanks Feel- for coming to the show. Thanks, yeah. Feeling the love from back home. My <laughs> wife's calling me all the time, obviously missing me terribly. Yeah. Not. <laughs> hey, there's there's tennis to there, there you know duty calls. This calendar you know, doesn't there's stop on love holidays. Tennis every day, Mitch. Yeah, yeah. Some people are feeling it more than others. Uh, I got to ask you first because you're coming back from you know you've been in the studio for a little bit. Yeah, coming back from the Australian run. How was it again? Calling those matches on site again. You're back in the groove there, and this Australia felt like it was a special one. We saw some greatness, maybe a little bit of a new superstar changing yep. of the guard emerged and on the women's side a, a back-to-back champion so how was it down in melbourne yeah melbourne was amazing um i tell you the thing about the the tournament down there that gives you so much sort of hope for the sport is just how popular it was uh, a million fans coming through the gates over the 15 days um i actually have to say i'm a convert to the sunday start mm-hmm. i think all slam should go to it i think it's a it's the right thing to do but the quality of tennis was was phenomenal um you know yannick to break through to pick up his first one was the big story but in terms of actually being there again it's uh, yeah tennis is in a great spot right now i'm still just so impressed with these athletes and their ability to play such high level tennis out of the gate there's no other sport like this where in a lot of ways but one being there's a major two weeks into the start of the season so you have to bring it or you're not going to be there very long yeah and obviously the, sh- the, the off season just feels so short now it feels mm-hmm. as though kind of basically you got maybe two weeks to get sort of some downtime and then you're back up at it with your fitness and then you've got your tennis and if you want to make any big changes you got to get straight back in the lab so Mitch you're right mm-hmm. it's a uh, it, it, it's tough to gauge and I think that's what's yeah. so impressive about Yannick so quickly is being able to do that mm-hmm. at the start of the season a lot to recap from this past week, and we'll look ahead to where we are on the tennis calendar. But first things first, Dallas Open. Listen to your call of that match with Jimmy Arias. Tommy Paul gets it done, gets a title, a home title. Does it by beating Marcos Garon and Ben Shelton in the semis. This was a nice bounce back for him. I know Australia didn't end the way he wanted it to, but he's up to 14 now in the rankings. And this was a good result that I feel like he needed. He went out and got yeah, he did need it. And I'm so happy for Brad uh, Stein, his coach, and for Tommy, you know, two of the great guys out there in the tour. And you want good things to happen to good people. I thought the quality, Mitch, of the final with Marcus, credit to Marcus. Mm. I thought he was awesome in Dallas. Um, you know, it was probably some of the best tennis I've seen alongside with mm-hmm. Australia. Honestly, that final will go down this year as being one of the highest qualities in terms of the rallies, the movement. They're not two servers that are yeah. just going to take the racket out of hand. But credit to Tommy, having lost those two match points against Ketsmanovic, trying to back mm-hmm. up a semi to do so well in his first tournament back in Dallas was impressive. It certainly was. My note on Marcos is, I guess, 30 is a new 20 across the board, right? Because he's not, I mean, it was credit to him. He's playing some of the best, maybe the best tennis of his life. And yeah, we're seeing this time and time again, like 30 is where the, I mean, Manorino is another case, but you know, they're playing their best into their 30s now. Yeah, I think for Marcos as well, look, the hip surgery is obviously one thing, but mentally to be the top recruit in the country, going to UCLA, and then having to take so long to break into the world's top 100, Mitch, mm-hmm. August 2020, to then mm-hmm. take another two years to break into the world's top 50, as it did. You know, for Marcus, that perseverance, that mm-hmm. n- not losing the desire, not losing the belief, yeah. is a huge credit to him. He's one of the great feel-good stories out there. You, you pull for mm-hmm. the guy every time he plays. I know you're not, you know, avoiding lists at times. You like to rank it, maybe. Would you put Tommy Paul as like a top five athlete in tennis, or is that am I in the range right? No, we love a ranking. Yeah. We love, yeah. we love <laughs> everyone loves yeah. a one to five. Everyone yeah. loves everyone loves uh, you know dumping on you when you get it wrong, exactly. or, or they don't agree with you. Exactly. But everyone's triggered, so let's go for yeah. it. Um, I do think Tommy Paul is in the top five. I do think the way that he plays, uh, his movement out there on the court is definitely top five in terms of the way he can can produce his shots and wh- how how good with a full running. That was that was insane the one was probably the shot of the year so far I know there's a lot of time but yeah he's to be able to get to the ball first of all and then put the pace on it I think that's a reason why styles make fights it's like boxing he gives Alcaraz more trouble than others because there's very few people that can match athleticism with him yeah you want litmus tests there's your litmus (laughs) test for how good a mover is Tommy Paul the fact that he makes Alcaraz's life as difficult that he as he does on a on a hard court is is a tribute to the way that Tommy moves he's awesome so good for him on that result. The American rankings, 14, 15, 16, are Paul, Tiafo, Shelton. In that order now, I got to I gotta bring it up because yep. Tiafo struggled. And this is, you know, five and nine since that U.S. Open match. I know there's Davis Cup matches in there, but he loses that match to Marcos. 
and another result, another poor result for him, given the standard first round Australia, what's gone wrong for him and how can he fix it? Yeah, listen, confidence is key ingredient yeah. for everyone. <laughs> uh, it's easy yeah. to sit there when things are going well. You can uh, you could even have me as your coach and you can still <laughs> win tennis matches, yeah. Mitch. But, you know, when, yeah. you, when you don't have the confidence, then you're obviously looking for guidance. Uh, mm -hmm. Not having Wayne on his back going through a tough period, I think, isn't a great thing for him. I think he will find it a little bit tricky with a new coach. Mm -hmm. That 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 joining of a new coach usually comes a, a fairly sort of big right. inflection point in a player's career. Um, and at the moment, they're struggling to find and gauge the right kind of solution to the problems. Now, he's, he's, he's hit a bit of a buffer here, and I'm not sure how quickly he'll get out of it. And there is a unique pressure to tennis that I don't think most people realize with defending points and defending a result. So he's going to feel that Indian Wells, the clay court event to a lesser extent, then grass when he won his grass court title. But that's the other pressure to this is that he's got some big tournaments he has to have to maintain his ranking. Yeah, and also when you go away from a coach that's done a great job with you, let's not forget Wayne got him up yeah. into you know the, the top 10 and, mm -hmm. and all of those things. You have a pressure to deliver. Mm -hmm. You have a pressure to, to have a, a reason why you that relationship didn't yeah. work. So there's an awful lot going on in, mm -hmm. you know, in Francis's world at the moment, um, inside the rectangle and outside, <laughs> that's making it tough for him. The lesson in all this is, and you can even get to the women's, which we want in a second, Naomi yeah. Osaka's look good, but the train doesn't stop. You're back, you're looking good, okay. These players are getting better too. Yeah. You know, So there's never going to be that down period. I do think we give more rope to the younger players who are still figuring it out, which we've seen. And I'd put Ben Shelton in that category. I don't know for a fact that he was 100% or not. There's you know the tape and whatnot, but he's gotten to a patch where... Guys have studied him. He's going to have to make tactical adjustments. I don't think we doubt that he will, but you know, we saw evidence Tommy Paul, a guy who wanted to get that win back. That was the other thing, a highly motivated Paul to get some revenge out there. Yeah, and also like to stay there, you make a great point. Like a lot of the time, when you make that burst and you get the breakthrough, you actually most players drop back. Mm -hmm. So you know, he's he's for for most people that's the norm. And trying to be against flow against that tide is not always easy. So I think from from Francis's point of view, um, he's just he, he'll figure it out. He's too good a player. He wants it too much, I believe. He's mm. just at the moment trying to trying to find those solutions. Margins are super slim. You know, there's opportunities galore, but there's also pressure across the board. Having said that, switching gears now to another tournament. This this storyline in France in Marseille, big match, Hugo and Bear, five for five in ATP finals. I was looking at the people he beat. He beat Dimitrov Sunday, but yep. there's wins over Rublev and Demonauer in there. So this isn't some fluke thing. Um, Bear did it again. He beat another very good player playing his game. Yeah, and there's another classic case of what we were just talking about. Uh, Umber got himself up to 25 in the world back in 2021, dropped outside the world's top 150 by the sort of mm -hmm. middle of the next year, and then he's, he's he slowly managed mm -hmm. to obviously get himself back up inside the world's top 20 this week. So, you know, it, it, it's not easy. No matter how <laughs> yeah. great you are, it's it's not easy. We look at the guys at the top, Mitch. You know, we look at yeah. Novak, and you look at Rafa, and you look at Roger, right. and you kind of measure everybody else's <laughs> career, which are always going to look sub optimal yeah. in that situation so you know Ugo's Ugo's figured it out he, he, he's got an amazing game he, t he, he is so super aggressive mm -hmm. that when he plays like that in conditions like that you can see how good he is the match against Hubie I believe it was in Australia yeah. was great like yeah. that took a lot for Hubie to win that match and yeah his game just to make a point you can expand is I love the the short back swings on some of his ground strokes he's not afraid to get to net he's very bold out there too which I don't want to say wasn't the norm for some of these younger French players coming up, but he's very well-rounded in how he plays. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't play timid in big moments. I think that's why five and zero in the finals. Yeah, when he's, you're right. He steps up and he and he and it's all on the line. He's he's produced his best tennis, and he is. And because of that as well, he's got mid-match strategy shifts, mm -hmm. and not everybody has that. Not everybody has those gear mm -hmm. shifts in a match that Umber has. But that also takes time for somebody like him to work out throughout mm -hmm. the course of your, so he gets the wins in 2021 yeah. through natural talent yeah. then you have to morph that natural talent into skill and strategy yeah. you know a little less flamboyant <laughs> you know and always comes with more criticism because right. people have based their analysis of you on talent and now when he's got what he has he's a formidable player on a, you know, that's funny you say that because on a larger, much larger, the yeah. biggest stakes in the game, that sounded a lot like what people are talking about Alcaraz right now. Yeah. That the talent is unworldly, we know. We're talking about, too, you're playing the very best players in the world who are studying you and trying to beat you. But maybe there could be, if you see it that way, some tactical adjustments made at times. 
I mean, I know I'm not uh, saying he's done. I don't want to. No, you're not saying he's do done. It. I know. No, no, no. I'm not putting you. And, yeah. and no one's saying it. Yeah. But like, I mean, what was that? His 13th major or something. Yeah, no, and he's I know. He won two of them, and everyone's yeah. already coming <laughs> crashing down and saying like he needs to yeah. do this. It's like once mm -hmm. again, you know, we we live in an unnatural time because we've had yeah. these three players that have won 20 plus majors, and you know mm -hmm. they have made you know sport, yeah. sporting immortality like normal. Yeah. So everybody else that's coming in their shadow mm -hmm. is getting judged on this ridiculous benchmark that mm -hmm. they're never going to hit. Do I think Carlos is going to win 20 Grand Slams? I don't. Mm -hmm. I think I. <laughs> I don't, but will he win double digits? I think he will. It's a pretty good career, right? Yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> seven, eight. It's like Macaro seven, Connors eight. These are Hall of Fame legends of the sport. Yeah, it is also a lot tougher when you get there first. You have that pressure, and guys like Sinner, Holger, do I'm going to disagree with you there. Okay, I'm going to disagree with okay. you there. Uh, not, not, yeah. not, not. I, 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 there's, there's a part of that that I agree with, right? Because right. obviously, you become the lighthouse for the tour. That's, yeah, and I, that's what I'm more. But mad. you've yes. won it, so he so knows he can win it. But yeah. his peers are looking at you like you're the target now. Yeah. So every match that you get from a guy like Sinner, or guy, to a lesser extent, the players coming up, that's their Super Bowl, to quote another popular sporting event. Yeah, it, you know? it is, but it's also what keeps them fresh. It's mm -hmm. what makes us as fans love the sport because yeah. you get an evolving strategy where something worked before. Look at the amount of times we saw Rafa change against Novak and Novak change yeah. against Rafa when it becomes a different surface. And that's what yeah. it is. Yeah, it's going to be challenging, but you know what? If everybody could do it, everybody <laughs> would be doing it. And yeah. I'd rather be in Carlos's yeah. shoes yeah. with a couple of majors under his belt than somebody you know that hasn't got it, mm -hmm. who's at the back end of their career career in the epilogue of their career going am I ever going to do it so I, I, I like his situation personally before we go into this week I did want to give credit to the women and I was watching TC live with you and Jimmy on yep. there and you talked about Rabakina winning another title and yep. is she the best server in the game and there's a lot of agreement in there with what she's done but the point that Jimmy made and I think you agree with too is that the rack the match really is on her terms yep. and that's such a and you can speak to it such an underrated thing to have she always has the hammer in her matches win or lose and, and and Mitch, we we live in a world now driven <laughs> yeah. by data, yeah. driven by analysis. Mm -hmm. This is the key to everybody's like yeah. world. This is going to unlock yeah. your success. Is is get your data, which I'm a big believer in. As you know, if you've mm -hmm. listened to my commentary, mm -hmm. I love trying to yeah. explain what's going on out there. Right. At the same time, as a coach, I love the fact that if you can make your game so good like Rabakina's <laughs> yeah. that you don't have to worry about 95% of the rest of the tour because on you, you're better than them. That makes the game a whole lot easier. You yeah. don't have to dig too deep. She knows what she does. She knows how good she can be. There's, yeah, you can get lost in the minutia of the data. And a lot of players kind of, you can see it happening where they, oh, I want to try this. I'm not sure. And when they're losing, yeah. you, I can guarantee you now, when players are losing, they're digging into the data analysis mm -hmm. and they, they eventually just get lost in it. When they're winning, it's all instinct. It's all the way that they play and they don't have to think so much. So I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of her game because she actually, her, her groundies are, are some of the best out yeah. there. It gets lost behind the serve. We're seduced <laughs> by the serve. But don't don't be don't sleep yeah. on the groundies. They're some of the best. Always seduced by serve. You got to yes. keep the Valentine's Day thing going. That's good. <laughs> and then the other the other champion too is Carolina Pliskova, which needs credit. I know Transylvania isn't the biggest tournament, but she's had to battle, missed some time, injuries, and has kept it going in in uh, Doha in Doha right now. So it's been kind of impressive to watch Pliskova, who's been number one in the world. We forget get back to this point. Yeah, well, the old class is, <laughs> class is permanent. is coming through with Pliskova, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah, she played great. Um, very tough journey, as, as everybody knows, from there to get there. The final being any longer in clues, she probably wouldn't even be mm -hmm. playing this week. Yeah. Um, but she's, she's, she's such a good player that she's got a, she's got a health. She feels good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she, she'll, she'll be in the mix by the end of the season. She might well be at mm -hmm. the WTO to a final, mm. wherever they may be. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to speculate. <laughs> yeah, let's not speculate. Where yeah. are they going to be? Yeah. Mm, let me think. Uh, <laughs> if you have a search engine, you might be able to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more with Mark Petchy here on Tennis Channel Inside In. I wanted to get your thoughts on some of the other news too, Mark, because I know you're not going to hold your tongue on this. And maybe <laughs> just give some honest takes here, but the coaching moves that we saw. Yep. Jessica Pagula, David Witt, yep. and a long tenured partnership. Holger Runa moving on from Boris Becker. Very short run there. 
Um, how do you see each? I know partnerships end, things don't work out, but is there any read you have on either thoughts that you just have? Um, I, I guess that Jesse was already having some doubts at the back end of last year mm -hmm. because that kind of came out of the blue. Um, mm -hmm. I was chatting to David Witt in Adelaide, so yeah, I don't think any, I don't think anybody in tennis really mm -hmm. saw that coming apart from Jess. But she knows what's best for her career. Mm -hmm. I think people always need to remember it's never personal. You know, it's a mm -hmm. short career. She obviously feels as though she's perhaps underperformed at the back end of these tournaments. She's been Miss Consistency, mm -hmm. but obviously she wants to be Miss Champion. Yeah. And ultimately she's looking for some solution to get her there. The serve is obviously going to be the area that they've constantly worked on. That's where she's going to be like trying to mine for that goal. Right. Um, as for Holger, that's just bizarre. You know, I mean, it's, you know, to get those guys on board, uh, th there's not enough time. I mean, Boris couldn't even travel to Australia for vet, for the, for known reasons. There's not enough time for you as a coach to really have an impact on a player's career. Some of the ideas that you have in the start of a career, mm -hmm. uh, start of a coaching sort of liaison, will die on the vine. You will have ideas that you think work and you try, but they actually don't work and they could cause a bit more doubt. For, for me, for me, I, I don't, I don't really understand. It certainly wasn't time. Let's be mm -hmm. honest. That was absolute, yeah. you know, that was a myth, you know, yeah. whatever that mirage was that they said they didn't have the time. <laughs> yeah. The fact was it, 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 it hasn't worked and, mm -hmm. and Holger needs to figure it out. Yeah. Because as you can say, right, there are terms set when you come into a partnership, you, outline a lot of this stuff well, the first thing you say is how how many how many weeks can you give me yeah and that's the first question that you ask yeah. you don't go like oh can you help me yeah sure i've got yeah. uh, i've got two days in uh, in july yeah you know it's like so that whole kind right of it was like wendell and murray a little bit too right because they figured out schedule and it yeah. wasn't going to be there the whole time yeah i it's weird circumstances there's obviously and, and look, I think the other side of this too, I know the society we live in and you mentioned it, but Holger wants to be where Carlos and now Sinner are. And he's yep. seen these guys succeed and there's pressure that he's feeling. Don't Doesn't mean we're going to write him off at all, but I think he's feeling it to get to that Grand Slam champion level. Wimbledon of last year, we would have probably put him ahead of Sinner in the pecking order at that time, which is how this game works. Yeah, and you know, credit to uh, Simone and Darren for yeah. being able to guide that ship. And he, he had some tougher times, as you say, but then picked it up in Canada last year, winning mm -hmm. uh, the Masters 1000 there, Yannick. And then he hasn't really looked mm -hmm. back from that particular point on. So um, you listen, everybody's journey is different. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be, you know, not as judgmental, but Holger needs some stability in that camp and mm -hmm. he needs it soon because it isn't as complicated as he's making it, mm -hmm. you know, he's a real, he's a great player already. You don't beat five top teners in a row to win a masters 1000 yeah. without pretty much nailed on knowing what you're trying yeah. to do out there. <laughs> you can't overcomplicate yeah. this game. You feel like if you rein them in, cause weirdly you don't have the questions in the back end of tournaments when he plays big players, he can beat them. Yeah. But rein it in, get that consistency, stability, and you'll unlock something. Totally. It's uh, it's impressive to see. Also impressive, Mark, got to give props. Naomi Osaka's kind of put it together this week. Had the uh, walkover win against Serenko. That's uh, number 14 for Serenko and walkover win. But I digress. Osaka into a quarterfinal. I know the, the results weren't there early, but this has to be ahead of schedule for okay, okay. herself. I, I Listen, I was in Australia. I was lucky enough yeah. to be there. Um, I didn't see a match live against Pushkover in Brisbane, but obviously lost the second set on a breaker, then mm -hmm. lost a tight one in the third. I saw her match live <laughs> against Garcia. Garcia is one of those people that, you know, a bit like Maxine Cressy on the guy's side, it's a completely different rhythm. You just don't practice against that. You know, you, you've got to try to mm -hmm. find a person that can help you, like, deal with that ultra-aggressive return. Yeah. She played great, Garcia. I promise you, if she could put far, like six more matches back to back okay. like that, she could have won the, the title. Mm -hmm. but I thought people were too quick to get down on Naomi after that loss. I thought people were like, oh, she's not going to be playing well till, you know, till Wimbledon. Well, I mean, they're already down on her on natural surfaces. So probably they were <laughs> thinking it was going to be the US Open. And I was like, no, she looked good. She yeah. just didn't have the time on the ball because Caroline played great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm delighted that she's bounced back so quickly to win those matches. She's in, she's in, good, she's in good shape. There, yeah, she's in good shape. It no, takes I don't time. mean that as a physical. I mean, she's right. in good shape hitting the ball right. physically, mentally. She looks happy. I mean, I think she's going to be a danger. I think the first thing we saw was how clean she was hitting the ball. And all the other stuff, right? Timing, maybe getting in a little bit better physical shape. That will come with practice, with reps. We know she's a champion. She can get there. The landscape has changed. But as you said, she drew a top player. Like she drew, that's a brutal first round draw. 
in a major is Caroline Garcia. So. It, it was it was hot. I mean, Pushkiva then Garcia. <laughs> I, I swear, if she had got given a half yeah. decent draw in Australia, she could have been fourth round quarters. The way that I thought she was hitting the ball. Well, so a, yeah. you know, been wrong before. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> yeah. and we'll never know. Yeah. But that was my sense when I walked away from that. I was very yeah. high on her on her standard. Well, she gets a chance for to go on a little mini revenge tour. Pushkiva again after yep. Garcia in this tournament. I have to ask your thoughts on Iga because she won today over Alexandrova. Yeah. She's up to 90 weeks now at number one, which is in a rare list, the 10th woman ever to do so. As far as this tournament goes, as far as this region of the world goes, she seems very comfortable with yeah. the conditions in the Middle East. Yeah, she doesn't lose too many games in this no. part of the world, does she? Yeah. I mean, let alone just trying to get a set off her here. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like trying to get a set off Rafa on a clay court mm -hmm. at his absolute peak, uh, which lasted about 15 years. Yeah. It's the similar kind of story for Iga here. She absolutely loves it. She's able to find the short angles. Listen, I'm... I'm interested to see, and, I'll, and we'll only know at the back end of this year, whether the change to the serve has been uh, more productive than it was last year. She actually had good numbers behind her first serve last year. I'm, I'm of the opinion that it's looking a little predictable. It did, um, and I think you're 100% right. In Australia, there were clear tells. I mean, the clean winners off, and there's certain players that are going to do yeah. that, but the numbers were all, okay, they were reading it better. That was in the data. Yeah, and it and I feel like the change has made it a little bit more mm -hmm. predictable about where she's probably going to serve, and therefore, you've got a question: Is it long term going to be something that she sticks with, or will it, will this be one of the iterations that we see in eager serve, and mm -hmm. it finally goes somewhere else, and it ends up being the serve that that, that helps her? Timing was weird, right? Because she finished so strong last yep. year. And that's where I get the long-term thing. We saw Tiger Woods change his golf swing. Totally. And then it helped long-term. But yep. yeah, I mean, and part of it is, right? The tide is raising. Sablanka comes back, wins, you know? And Coco has a major now. Rabakin is looking good, so. Yeah, because the yeah. return game's <laughs> a joke. I mean, she's winning 50% of the return games. If she can obviously mm -hmm. add a little bit more in terms of service games won, she is going to make herself almost unplayable. The rationale mm -hmm. behind it yeah. is excellent. I'm not totally sure that the outcome isn't going to cause her more problems right. and consequences down the road. Do you have any, in a, in a scale of no worry to a <laughs> little bit of worried with Coco's performance, losing that first round, just one match? I only bring this up because yeah. the unforced air numbers were in the 40s, and that's not <laughs> what any coach wants. No, that's sort of my territory. That I, I can talk about that with, uh, with, yeah. with deep, deep yeah. data analysis. Listen, I... I I I I am a little yeah I think that forehand side is going to get peppered. I mean if you're you know the That's more what Iga does the more time mm -hmm. she goes through she's just going to have to like what where it worked in the summer where she could hit high balls down the line and then obviously you would go cross court to bring her mm -hmm. backhand into play and because she's a phenomenal athlete she's able to get away with, away with it. The serve I think looks nice. Roddick's obviously done a great job. Uh, I am. I think that forehand is going to come under so much scrutiny. It's going to be difficult for her to not think of it as a bit of an issue in mm -hmm. her mind, which is not what you want when you're between the lines. We all know where you stand with Coco as an yeah. athlete, so we got exactly. that. Yeah. We got that one before. Yeah, and, I, it, and, it, and it and it and it will never change. No, no. I, like, yeah. Okay, defend it. Yeah. I uh, I also think in a weird way, Siniakova that matchup. Like we all know that they're great players yep. at the top of the game but how she played being an athlete I don't want to use that pusher term too much but it's almost like that's a tougher task for Coco than a bigger player that she could be the one defending because that match was a lot of Cindy Akiva, to her credit getting every ball back and then that led to the airs yeah and I think that's going to be a really interesting sort of part of this year is mm -hmm. watching how people take on Coco <laughs> because mm -hmm. obviously if you're not hitting clean winners off the forehand side which is always going to be you should be your greatest mm -hmm. winner number count yeah you and if you feel safe going to an opponent's forehand there's going to be a lot of people out there suddenly going well I don't need to overplay no <laughs> you know so yeah. she, and she'll have to deal with that change of mentality which is tough for a player Mitch right. because trying to tell your player hey go to the player's forehand you're like what with nothing on it <laughs> yeah, go with nothing on it. Like that just doesn't feel like a yeah. strategy that's going to work. But hey, you just stay in yeah. the point. You stay in the point. So it, it, it's it's going to be an interesting evolution. Well, we got Iga in the quarterfinals against Victoria Azarenka, who beat Ostapenko. Ostapenko now fourteen and three on the year, 
All yep. three losses to Azarenka. She loves Azarenka, <laughs> by the way. There's all this like n- nonsense yeah. at the handshake today. Yeah, with the, the racket, racket tap thing. But that's just the, the, the politics of the Ukraine war. Yeah. Um, she she's outwardly and openly said that Vika is one of her, <laughs> is a favorite player. So yeah. you know, everyone needs to again just like you know calm down. Right. I'm not worried about that. I'm more like wow. Like, yeah. Have you ever? I mean, did you have experience with certain players that's just like man, I could be having everyone. a good year. Like okay, everyone, yeah, everyone. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> I had a good record against Patty Rafter. I, I was three and zero against Patty. So Rafter. you were you were the other side. So then, yeah. you always have somebody that you kind of like playing uh, for whatever reason. Um, but mm. listen, if I'd have been on the court more often with Patty, I, I would have lost. Right. So you know, but yeah, yeah five and zero. Oh, um, you know, mm. well, Umber's five and zero oh against Rusevori, right? He's mm. lost every time he's played the fence. So match up in styles are a big part of this sport. So weird because Ostapenko clearly playing the best tennis yeah. since twenty seventeen. Just can't beat Vika. Yeah. Well, I did want to wrap this up talking about what we have coming up on the men's side too. We got Alcaraz on the clay in Buenos yeah. Aires. We know it's a nice little appearance fee for him to go down there. I think we can say, but uh, him back on the court, center plate today as well. So these two young guys playing, especially center in Rotterdam after that first life changing win gets by in straight sets. But do you think the pressure will continue to alleviate a little bit for him? No, I mean he's the, the yeah the pressure's gone for Yannick. Yeah. He's done. He's He's done it. You know, he's, he's managed to get his maiden major. Uh, he comes into these sort of conditions. I mean, he is fully equipped to play well in, in Rotterdam. Biggest hitter combined off the, off, off each wing. Yeah. He's going to, he's, he's going to dominate. I mean, so yeah, I, I, I mean, he's in, he's in good spot. <laughs> he's just like to see our Kras and Sinner in more draws together. We would, yeah. this is the part where it's like they're at a distance, but do you see, cause looking at the rankings right now, and I talked to Paul Anacone about this last year where he said there's, you know, any given tournament it could break right. You have seven to however many contenders, but the real guys at the top. Is there, are we getting to a big four range? Because the top four have separated themselves ranking wise. Well, they have. I think the, you need to go back to 2009 <laughs> to yeah. see the, the next time that there was somebody, and it was Novak at the time, yeah. that had more points than Yannick does um, in the big, as the last as of four. the big four, yeah. as in the four. Yeah. And then you've got the big drop off. And then you've got a pretty big drop off between 13 and 14. You've almost got three tiers <laughs> at the moment in the men's game mm-hmm. that are, are pretty much at the moment secured. Uh, yes, mm. there's your answer. <laughs> Because with Sinner, Medvedev proving, and he almost pulled it off. We were all watching Australia, like, is he going to pull this off uh, with the w- little energy he had? But Sinner elevating his game. We know about Djokovic and Alcaraz. It's going to be tough. Rublev at five, but it's, you know, these guys have put in the work, and you know it's cumulative. It's not just one big result. It's a year-round grind to get to where these guys are. Yeah, and a big shout-out to Daniel for that run at Australia and the final that he gave <laughs> us. I mean, absolute heartbreak. I mean, it's rare that you kind of commentate on a match and then you just have completely mixed emotions at the <laughs> end of it because you want to be super happy for Yannick, but to, to lose two Aussie Open finals from two sets to love <laughs> up and also just completely gear shift your strategy, like completely uh, bombing groundies, standing up on the baseline, uh, you know, huge kudos to, to Daniel and, you know, hopefully there's another major around the corner for him. I think it's going to be fun to see. Uh, we'll see when we see Novak yep. Djokovic, Rafael Nadal again as well, trying to come back Indian Wells. We hope to see those guys. I want to let you go with this, Mark. Uh, I know you probably think, and I've seen some of the comments, but we can say guys like Andy Murray have the right to retire whenever they want to. <laughs> I don't want to pile on, but everyone, this is one of the few times I felt good. It's like, wow, the entire tennis community agrees on something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Andy, Andy is... Uh, has become an icon of the sport for so many reasons. Um, and he has become a beacon of hope to a lot of people, uh, especially coming from Dunblane and all of those, um, you know, the situation there. But for Andy, what I love about this situation is how much he loves doing something. How many people that are telling him to stop have ever loved what they have done with the passion that Andy does, that he's willing to do what he's doing and go through to try and get him hit some match wins for him. He knows in his heart of hearts that another major is out of the question, but he still loves his job that much that he's willing to do anything for it. He can retire whenever he wants. I hope he doesn't retire too soon. I hope he doesn't either. Um, we know the standards, right? That point you made is so perfect. A guy that's won as much knows what the standard is, knows where he's at, knows can, can see the landscape better than everyone. But he just loves playing. It's as simple as that. And you know what? He's number 50 in the world. He would like to be higher. He isn't. He understands that. He's qualifying for these tournaments. It's not like, what do we, you know, it's, it's one thing. Like, yes, we remember them as our greats, but they have earned the right to play as long as they're still within that threshold and playing, and he's still there. So let him keep playing. Yeah, and also the people that are criticizing him and that are <laughs> sh- uh, telling him to stop have never done anything in their life 
as well as he's done what he's done in, in his life. And they don't understand what drives these elite athletes to do what they've done. The sacrifice, I remember practicing with Stefan Edberg three years after he, we, he lived in London at the time and I would practice with him after he'd retired. Honestly, I don't know why he retired because he was still that good. He was still not yeah. losing sets to Tim Hemmen. He still played three times a week. Yeah. This, this, is, this is a drug that runs in their vein, this sport. And they just, and it's so difficult to give it up. And Andy will just, he, he, he will go to the ends of the earth to, to have another big run somewhere. Appreciate these greats and uh, appreciate Mark Petchy for joining me on Tennis Channel Inside In. Always a pleasure. Love having you in the studio, following your matches uh, abroad that you're calling. You know, keep it going and keep throwing in those British phrases as well to keep us on our toes right. here. But I thanks, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, man.